Hello, I'm Christian Book. I'm an experimental poet, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Xenotext, my current project. The Xenotext is a kind of experiment, a literary exercise that explores the aesthetic potential of genetics in the modern milieu, doing so in order to make literal the renowned aphorism of William S. Burroughs, who has declared that the word is now a virus. My experiment proposes to address some of the sociological implications of biotechnology by manufacturing a xenotext, a beautiful anomalous poem whose alien words might subsist like a harmless parasite inside the cell of another life form. I have composed my own example of living poetry so that when translated into a gene and then integrated into the cell, the text nevertheless gets expressed by the organism which, in response to this grafted genetic sequence, begins to manufacture a viable, benign protein, one that, according to the original chemical alphabet, is itself yet another text. I am, in effect, trying to engineer a primitive bacterium so that it becomes not only a durable archive for storing a poem, but also an operant machine for writing a poem. Could I get the next slide? Dinococcus radiodurans is the proposed symbiote for my xenotext, in part because this extremophile can repair its own DNA so quickly that the germ resists mutation. Scorch it, freeze it, wither it, and still it endures. It can survive exposure to the vacuum of outer space. It can withstand dosages of gamma rays 1,000 times more lethal than the dosage needed to obliterate a human being. A few biologists, including Anatoly K. Pavlov and others, have argued that the ancestor of this organism must be extraterrestrial in its origin. The next slide, please. Because there exists a codependent biochemical relationship between any preliminary genetic sequence and its resulting protein sequence, my two poems must likewise be bijective in their structure, and I have to imagine pairing off all the letters of the alphabet so that they are mutually assigned to each other, knowing that there exist 7,905,853,580,625 possibilities for such encipherments. Now write an eloquent poem such that if we replace every single letter with its counterpart from this code, we get yet another eloquent poem. After nearly four years of failure, just trying to write two intelligible texts according to this very burdensome constraint, I have nevertheless made the prerequisite breakthrough, which you see here. The poem on the left is the poem that I have written to be enciphered as a genetic sequence and implanted into the genome of this bacterium. The poem on the right is the work that the organism writes in response after reading such a genetic sequence, and it embodies this poem in a sequence of amino acids that make up a protein. The in a code that you see at the top of the screen is the way in which the two letters of the alphabet have been paired off with each other. So I'll read to you these two poems. This is the poem uh, which I've nicknamed Orpheus. It's the one on the left. Any style of life is prim. Oh, stay, my lyre, with wily ploys, moan the riff, the riff of any tune aloud. Moan now my fate, in fate we rely. My myth now is the word, the word of life. Now the organism reads this poem, and in response it writes this text, which I've nicknamed Eurydice. The fairy is rosy of glow. In fate we rely. Moan more grief with any loss. Any loss is the achy trick. With him we stay. Oh, stay, my lyre. We wean him of any milk. Any milk is rosy. Now, the text on the left is written by me as a kind of masculine assertion about the aesthetic creation of life while the text on the right is written by the microbe as a kind of feminine refutation about the woebegone absence of life. 
The two poems resemble Petrarchan sonnets in dialogue with each other, much like poems written in the elegiac pastoral tradition of the herd boy addressing the nymphette. Moreover, the protein that enciphers the poem by the microbe is going to be chemically tagged so as to make the cell glow red in the dark. The microbe is, in effect, going to fluoresce rubescently in a fey way that embodies the rosiness attributed to the fairy described within the content of the poem itself. The next slide, please. On March 31st, uh, 2011, my lab at the University of Calgary uh, confirmed that the gene XP13 caused a colony of E. coli to fluoresce red in our test runs, implying that when implanted into the genome of this bacterium, my poem caused the cell to write its own poem in response. However, uh, later tests uh, showed that the protein was only half as massive as expected, implying that the germ was censoring my poem, destroying it during expression. I had, in in effect, engineered not the first microbial writer, but the first microbial critic. (laughs) The next slide, please. On uh, October 3rd, 2012, after months of failed assays, I finally received confirmation from the lab at DNA 2.0 that my revised genetic cipher gene XP13-4A did cause its colony of E. coli to fluoresce properly without destroying the poetic matter of the protein. So now I can say that I am the first person in history to design a microorganism capable of writing a meaningful text in response to an enciphered gene. Now I'm collaborating with a lab at the University of Wyoming right now in order to implant this gene into Deinococcus radiodurans. The dark blot in the second lane from the left uh, signals the presence of the poem in E. coli. That's how I know it's working. The next slide, please. Now, this image is the backbone of the resulting protein after two femtoseconds of folding, and this image depicts what the poem is expected to look like at the atomic level in the cell, at least according to computerized simulations. The next slide, please. Now, this image depicts the molecular embodiment of the xenotext as a kind of sculptural translation of the poem itself, a model made out of toy molecules for exhibit in a gallery. And this artwork has just recently appeared at the power plant in Toronto. The xenotext ultimately infects the language of genetics with the poetic vectors of its own discourse, doing so in order to show that through the use of such biological emissaries, we might transmit messages across stellar distances or even epochal intervals. And unlike any other cultural artifacts so far produced, except perhaps for the pioneer probes or the voyager probes, my poem stored inside the genome of a bacterium might testify to our presence upon the planet until the very hour when at last the sun itself explodes. I am striving in effect, to produce an immortal artifact in the face of our own inevitable extinction. Thank you.